pleasure to invite Mr. Mike Johnson to come share from the Word with us. <coughs> On January the 12th, 2010, a massive earthquake devastated Haiti. It has been updated that over 300,000 people lost their life. They were killed as a result of the earthquake and the ensuing humanitarian disaster of exposure, hunger, and lack of medical assistance and other calamities. Many countries came to their aid, including people in the U.S. At the church we were going to at the time, a church member's daughter had been on mission trips. And she belonged to another church, and people from both churches, we got together, and we formed a group for a short-term mission trip to Haiti. Now this was a new experience for us, except for our leader, the daughter of our church member. And we began by having planning meetings. We had prayer meetings and planning meetings to discover our purpose and how many people would go and how would we fund this trip and the many other details for a trip like this. All of us had a desire to reach out beyond the borders of our church and help people devastated by this tragedy. We wanted to be a part of reaching others with help and demonstrating faith and sharing the hope of Jesus Christ and his love. Now today, I am closing out Colossians, and I think it will be important to do a review of Colossians. Now, I can't cover everything in Colossians, and of course, I have picked out uh, certain uh, themes to go with in Colossians. And I'm going to review today Paul's message of faith, hope, and love that enables us to grow the church. You see, the Colossians was a church under challenge. The Colossians' faith was being challenged by false teaching. False teaching that promoted Jewish laws and ceremonies. False preaching that promoted not a knowledge called Gnosis. It was a, supposed to be a special type of knowledge to be found and involved the denial of the deity of Christ. False teaching that promoted the worship of angels and using them as mediators. False teaching that promoted the, a select group of individuals in the community that were privileged people to be the leaders to be worshipped and looked up to. Now, we experience similar practices today. Our church is under challenge, especially the denial of the deity of Christ and the promotion that there are many ways to heaven. We experience around us a philosophy that I'm a good person, so I'm going to heaven. There are many other challenges to the church today. And we need to be grounded in faith, hope, and love to face these challenges properly. Paul wrote in chapters 1 and 2 to remind the Colossians their faith is grounded in the power of Christ. In chapter 1, 
verses 16 and 17, Paul describes Christ as the creator and the maintainer of our universe, including his church. In chapter 1, verses 21 and 23, Paul reminds the Colossians and us that Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. In chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, Paul describes wisdom and knowledge are important to understanding faith. There are many ways we can be reminded of the power of Christ. We can look outside and look up at the, at the stars, at our clouds, our uh, environment, and see how it all works together. We can look at animals and plants and the so-called mystery of life, of how biology works. And we can examine human nature and especially examine our capability to reason. And we can also look at our capability of not to reason, like when we're going down 635. So we can look around our universe and we can see there must be a powerful force that made all these things that made all these things that we know and that we are still discovering. And that powerful force is Christ. But most importantly, we can examine ourselves and know something is inherently wrong with us and we need to be fixed. We can't do it ourselves, no matter how hard we try. And if we examine closely, we will know we need a Redeemer, and that Redeemer is Christ. Because we have been given his story, and we know him. And Paul wrote about this in chapter 1. So chapter 1 and part of chapter 2 is about the power of Christ as our Creator and our Redeemer. Paul then mounts into a defense for Christianity in chapters 2 and 3 to prepare us for the challenge against our hope and our Redeemer. Paul warns our hope will be challenged by false philosophies, but we need to stay grounded in the work of our Redeemer. In chapter 2, verse 8, Paul warns us not to be changed by false philosophies. He writes, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Just like the Colossians, that were being influenced by their culture around them, we too are influenced by the culture around us. Our culture tells us to be individuals, to achieve, to desire more and deserve more. Our culture tells us that we can believe anything we want to believe and still enjoy the hope of eternal life with God. We must recognize these false teachings and be prepared to answer to them with knowledge and wisdom. Now in chapter 3, 1 through 3, Paul describes our hope is grounded in a changed life by the work of our Redeemer. It says, if you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. 
For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So in chapter 1, Paul describes the message of faith and the power of Christ. And in chapter 2 and 3, he warns the Colossians and he warns us of false teaching and reminds us to be strong with our hope in Christ as our Redeemer. Our hope is our redemption that we can partially experience today, now, by living a changed life because Christ is in us. And that one day we will experience our full redemption. And in chapter 3, Paul describes how to live the new life of a Christian based on love. In chapter 3, 5, Paul describes the life change we must make and how to accomplish that change. He writes, verse 5, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Paul describes we need to stop living as the world wants us to live. And in chapter 3, verse 10, Paul describes our new life is continually being renewed to be like Christ. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 9. It says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Verse 10. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. You see, we are constantly being upgraded with the knowledge of Christ into his image. And in chapter 3, 14, Paul tells us love is the most important quality to have unity with other Christians. He writes, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. In chapter 3, 15, and 17, Paul describes how we can accomplish our new life. He writes, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, we accomplish our new life together with other Christians, working for our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has given us the basics of a Christian life. He has described our faith in our Creator. He has described our hope in our Redeemer Christ and the love of Christ that binds us in unity. Now, Paul concludes... Colossians in chapter 4. In chapter 4, Paul gives an example in Epaphras how to demonstrate faith, hope, and love. Now we first learn of Epaphras in chapters 1, 7, and 8. Paul wrote, you learn this from Epaphras. He's speaking to the uh, Colossians. You learn this from Epaphras, our dearly loved fellow slave. He is a faithful servant 
of the Messiah on your behalf. And he has told us about your love in the Spirit. We can understand that Paul held Epaphras in high regard as a fellow servant that he represented and that he represented the Colossians to Paul. It was by Epaphras that Paul knew of the Colossae church. He knew of their spiritual condition and the challenge that they faced. The challenge and the experience of false teachings and false philosophies. So now, in chapter 4, 12 and 13, that will be our main text for today. I know we've heard a lot of scripture, but I want to focus on the main text for today of 12, verses 12 and 13. We close out, Paul closes out Colossians with, um, with these verses. And he gives a description of a papyrus. He just gives a, a description of how papyrus lives his life. Papyrus demonstrates faith in prayer, hope and commitment, and love and teamwork to live as Christ in challenging times. He writes, Epaphras, who is one of you, he's speaking to the Colossians. Epaphras is one of the Colossians. A slave of Jesus of Christ Jesus greets you. See, Epaphras is with Paul while he is under house arrest. Evidently, he came to Paul to uh, get some advice uh, for the Colossian church and be strengthened in knowledge and wisdom. Paul continues, he, he writes, He is always contending for you in his prayers so that you can stand mature and fully assured in everything God wills. For I testify about him that how that he works hard for you, the Colossians, and for those in Laodicea and for those in Heropolis. You see, in verse 12, first, Epaphras demonstrates faith in his prayer life. First, he prayed always, continually. He didn't just pray when he felt like it or just pray to, to get it done. He prayed consistently all the time. Second, Paul describes Epaphras, prayed, contending. That's the word the ESV uses, prayed, contending. That sounds a little strange to us. The Greek word is, uh, let me see if I can say this, agonisomenos, and it means a struggle. This describes the concern and seriousness of faith as he was praying. Now the RSV uses the word earnestly praying. I like that description a little better. Paul, uh, Epaphras, prayed earnestly. When was the last time you prayed with such fervor of your faith that it was exhausting to you? Epaphras regularly, continually prayed fervently and earnestly. Third, Epaphras prayed specifically for the people in his church. He maintained a special relationship with them in prayer. Paul uses the, Paul uses the phrase, for you, several times. Let me get to the right verse. Okay. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, greets you, all go away struggling on your behalf, that you may stand. And he has worked hard for you. 
So you see, Epaphras knew his members and their needs. So this wasn't a generalized prayer, but it was very personal for Epaphras. By his faith, he knew he was making a difference personally. Fourth, Epaphras, Epaphras prayed with intentional faith that his fellow believers would grow in their faith and practice, grow in their faith and their practice to do God's will. Epaphras is a great example demonstrating faith in continuous, earnest, specific, and intentional prayer. Next, Epaphras demonstrates hope and commitment. Hope is what Jesus has promised us as our Redeemer. Paul describes Epaphras as a slave of Christ Jesus, committed to the hope Christ has given to us. He is committed to what Jesus Christ has done as our Redeemer. He is a slave of Christ Jesus. As a slave, he is sacrificially working for Jesus Christ, spreading the good news of hope in salvation from Christ, not only to the Colossians, but to the church in Laodicea and Heropolis. So Epaphras has demonstrated faith and prayer and hope and commitment to Christ. Next, we see Epaphras demonstrates love and unity of teamwork. Paul describes Epaphras as one of the Colossians. One of you, he says. He is part of the Colossian church. He is a slave working with and for Jesus Christ, and he works hard for the Colossians, the Laodiceans, and the Heropolians. Heropolians. Paul describes Epaphras as part of a Christian team. Now, it takes a lot of love to be unified with a lot of other people, especially from other communities. And it takes a lot of love to be dedicated as a, sli as a slave of Christ Jesus. Epaphras demonstrated to, to us faith in prayer, hope and commitment, and love and unity and teamwork. Prayer is a great start for developing a relationship with God, to know your purpose and to reach other people in ways that you could never expect. I see that today in our prayer sessions. I see it every Sunday as we gather and we pray for our church. And we pray for our leaders. And I know our leaders pray for us. And we're personally connected to other people in our congregation. Epaphras is a good example of prayer hope, and love. Now, our meetings for our trip to Haiti started and ended with prayer. And we encouraged and prayed continuously at other times. Our leader found a short-term short mission uh, organization that matched our needs and experience and our abilities. And we had to raise funds rather quickly because we planned to go in August. And this was the spring of 2010. We set deadlines to buy our airfare and for other expenses, including our short-term mission guide and all the provisions we needed while in Haiti. Our church was in the process of relocation and downsizing and had a variety of stuff to get rid of. So they let us have a garage sale. And in fact, we had a couple of garage sales. And it was a large team effort 
to organize and handle all of these items from the church and from many donations from people to help fund our trip. Now, whenever you have a group of people, you can have agreements and you can have disagreements. Agreements are easy, are, are easy, but disagreements can really cause a lot of problems. And I'm glad to say that in this group of people, we had a lot of love floating around during this adventure. All of us worked together in harmony, despite a variety of backgrounds and ages. And we accomplished raising our funds. Most, and I think almost everyone, have never been to a third country, except for myself, let alone the poorest country in our hemisphere. In Guatemala, I had experienced the third world, but in Haiti, this was beyond anything I had ever experienced in Guatemala. It was shocking to see the living conditions and the devastation in Haiti. Upon arriving in Haiti, we joined a couple of other teams and we distributed medical supplies and food in various places, including some orphanages and uh, we went to the famous, I'm gonna say famous tent cities. We had interpreters and we spent a lot of time visiting and listening to people's stories, and we prayed with them, and they prayed for us. It was amazing, the faith, hope, and love of the Haitian people, the faith, hope, and love that they demonstrated in this horrific time of this disaster. We were all continually touched by the depth of their spiritual life, and the faith and the hope of Jesus Christ. Faith, hope, and love can be demonstrated in various ways. Epaphras is an example Paul gave to us of a person with faith and prayer and hope and commitment to Christ as our Redeemer and love as a fellow servant working hard with, in teamwork for Christ's church. How do you demonstrate faith, hope, and love? I hope as you remember Colossians, that you remember the challenges they faced to live in a culture that was antagonistic to Christians. A culture that offered alternatives to the change in life that Christ brings on you, that Christ brings to you as a believer. Our culture, our world, wants your commitment to pride and self-worth and possessions and self-indulgence and self-satisfaction, and we look for quick and easy answers. Our world wants you to believe there are many ways to heaven because you are good. We need to recognize the false teaching and preaching of our world. Christ has provided a solution to our faults, to our sin. And when you accept him as Savior, he lives in you to change your life. As you change, you demonstrate faith, hope, and love for others to know and experience Christ. Our family and friends watch and learn from our demonstrations of faith, hope, and love. That's our service to Christ, to demonstrate faith, hope, and love for others to know and accept we cannot always know what God will provide or when he will provide. But as fellow servants of Christ, we can be unified in faith, hope, and love. 
What are some challenges in your life to your faith? How can you demonstrate faith, hope, and love? How about start with prayer? Commit yourself to Christ, our Redeemer, and demonstrate love and unity with, with other believers. Help grow our church by prayer, commitment to Christ's hope for others, and demonstrating love through unity with other Christians. Amen.